Hey, everybody. Eric Enga with Proficient uh, here. Uh, thanks for joining us today. With me is Jay Bear. I'm thrilled to have you here, Jay. Um, uh, you know, very interesting. Seventh generation entrepreneur. I found that whole thing about your background fascinating. Although I understand that your son has one up to you because he's starting his own business. So he's an eighth generation entrepreneur. Yes, he has his own fashion label that he started when he was like 16. So yes, he he's eighth generation. My family started uh, in the, I don't know, it'd be late 1700s or late 1800s in the casket making business. So oh, if we have any questions in today's session about how to make a, a great casket, I could weigh in on that as well. Uh, there could be some UX issues related to that. For <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Got to have handles, for example. Don't forget handles. Yeah, absolutely. So, all right. So, I mean, you've written a bunch of best-selling books, uh, six, I believe. Yes, sir. Uh, founded a bunch of companies, multi-million dollar companies along the way. Uh, inductee into the Professional Speaking Hall of Fame. Um, that's a, a whale of a resume, dude. Oh, thank you. Very kind. Most of it's true. Some of it's not. Uh, but for purposes of today's presentation, uh, it, it will suffice. It's great to be with you. I always enjoy our chats. Yeah, no, likewise. So um, but let's dig in. Um, so we're going to talk about UX, and we're also going to talk about UX and impact on SEO too today. Uh, yeah. So we're going to get flavors of both. Um, and But let, let's start with, you know, what's the cost of a, a poor UX? Well, it, it's it's somewhat difficult to define because it is by definition circumstantial and scenario driven. But, but I think without being terribly alarmist, the potential cost of, of poor UX is the viability of your company. Uh, you know, increasingly when products and services uh, find equilibrium. And what I mean by that is that more and more and more what you sell, whether it's a product or service is, pretty similar from when everybody else sells. It's it's harder than ever to differentiate on the basis of product uh, or, or service. And consequently, sometimes the deciding factor between your success and your failure is is user experience, ease of use, and and related issues. So uh, it, it is surprising to me. I, I, I started off doing UX consulting many, many years ago, uh, really in the first early days of the internet. As I think you know, Eric, I started in, in uh, online in 1993, uh, when domain names were still free, so I've seen the entire uh, the entire unfolding of this circumstance, and and you know from from then to now, obviously UX is is uh, is a bigger deal than it was then. But even now, I find it criminally understudied and and uh, under discussed. Hopefully, we can help uh, help that a little bit uh, here here today. Yeah, no, absolutely, and. I got to flash up a quick example here of an outdated looking UX from yeah. a company called uh, Tokyo Marine. This is something that we worked on and helped them with. Um, you see that it just has a sort of a, a flat, uh, lifeless feel. It's a little bit disconnected and inconsistent, as it says in the, uh, in the title line. And after doing a little work on it, um, we got a UX that looks more like, see if we can get the timing right, this. Uh, which uh, you know, definitely uh, feels more engaging, um, yeah. more customer focused, and frankly, just more ready to be scaled to a mobile device than than the original site. So this is something. Yeah, and, and I think it's an interesting example, Eric, because because the before is not abjectly terrible, right? It's it's not it's yeah. not like comically bad where you're like, all right, that's. That's clearly, uh, you know, an animated envelope into the mailbox, you know, style, uh, uh, style UX from back in the day. Uh, you know, we're not we're not using a, a MIDI file to play a song on the homepage, uh, but but it is you can see the small differences can have such a colossal impact on on user experience, right? And how people feel about the site, really, and I think is That's part it. of it. And and so user experience has really been around a long time. Um, yeah, I guess the question is, is it like more important than ever before or what's your take yeah no i think i think i think it is for a couple of reasons uh one as mentioned is harder than ever to differentiate on the basis of 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 product or service or even price right it used to be hey you know what yeah our ux is kind of terrible but but we have such a better mousetrap or our mousetrap is so much less expensive that that we can afford 
a, a less than adequate UX. And, and for most businesses and most industries, th that play is no longer valid. It's just really, really difficult to make that stick. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is I believe consumers and customers of all types and sizes and descriptions have more of an awareness of, of UX, have, have both experienced great UX and, and manifestly terrible UX and, and their patience uh, for less than adequate user experiences is at an all time low. There's a lot of research to suggest that that is the case as well. I, I just feel like people don't give you a pass the way they used to. And, and, and some of that is just kind of the nature of consumers and their comfort with technology and interfaces. And, and some of it is this um, phenomenon that we talk a lot about to our clients at Convince and Convert, this notion that, that customer expectations are liquid now. And when I say that, I mean they, they slosh over from category to category. So it wasn't that long ago, Eric, that somebody would say, well, yeah, I mean, that's not a great UX, but it's good enough for a bank. Or, or that's not a great UX, but you know what? They're a hospital, so I don't really expect that from them. And, and that isn't really the case as much anymore. Nowadays, customers and consumers expect UX consistency, expect US excellence, regardless of your category of business. And that's a pretty big change. So I would say to answer your question, yeah, it's, it's more important than ever before. Right. So just to sort of net that all out is, once you've seen a really good one, it's yeah. so jarring to go back to a bad one. And yes, so your hospital example, right? Uh, uh, so you, you deal with this hospital, you deal with that hospital, you get used to crappy UX, and then for some reason you're dealing with another hospital, and it's like really well put together. It's like you go back to those first two, and it's like, oh my god, what's wrong with these people? Yeah, you're like, if these guys can do it, how come they can't do it, right? You you know, it, it, you just sort of expect that everybody can can match up. I remember very clearly uh, in my hometown of Lake Havasu City, Arizona, when Taco Bell became the first fast food franchise to be open 24 hours a day. And I was like, my first thought was, oh my God, you're telling me I can get a taco at 2.30 in the morning? This is the greatest thing that ever happened. And my second thought was, well, what's Burger King's problem? Why are they closing at 10, right? You just, you know, once somebody has set the bar, you want everybody to meet that same level. And I think UX works exactly the same way. Yeah, the competitive market pressures just win out in the end. Yeah, it's huge. It's huge. Yep. Uh, so hopefully, uh, hopefully our, our participants in today's session agree that UX is A, important, B, more important than ever. But of course, uh, UX isn't, isn't free. UX optimization isn't um, uh, without cost. So, so in organizations where there are resource uh, constraints, Eric, which is fundamentally all organizations, how do you make the case for UX optimization? How, how do you make the business case to say, hey, Th these are dollars um, worth spending um, or euros worth spending or whatever your currency is, uh, and that will pay off for the organization uh, at the end. Well, you know, I, it, obviously there's some variance depending on who you're selling to within the organization, right? And whenever I get these kinds of questions, regardless of the dimension that uh, people are asking about, you have to learn to speak their language. Um, but at the end of the day, I think it's, always very helpful to pull up real metrics. So um, I'm going to show a chart here uh, from a company called SimilarWeb, uh, which is a great tool for, for monitoring actual traffic. This is uh, a chart showing several companies in the used car listing space. Um, and it's got several metrics on it, uh, on it. If you click through right now, the graphic is for bounce rate but you can actually click things and see page views per visitor, time on site, those various metrics. Um, and so in this particular page, uh, um, case, we see the Carfax uh, is the blue line up top. They have a much higher bounce rate than their competition. Um, and, and you know, where I'm working with Carfax, I'd go to you know, management and say, hey, look at this. We are, you know, we have double the bounce rate of all our competitors. And, and making that competitive argument is always, I think, really, really telling. It's, it's such a motivator for people to like get them off the dime and willing to do something. Um, and you know, there, there are tools like this. Uh, and like I say, you know, you can get page views per visitor, time on site, they're all good metrics. Another way you can go about that is to show them some various industry studies. So um, next up, this is just some data from eMarketer. Uh, which basically you know, talks about uh, the impact of negative experiences on users. 
uh, and you know how people respond to these things. And this is pretty telling too. Uh, you know, one and I'm out basically. One bad experience that I'm done with you. And that's a pretty significant percentage of people. So give it, you got one shot, not even two. Yeah, and it's three. I think it's three quarters or so are are out within three three bad experiences, right? Three out yeah. of four customers. So that's you know that that's that's a real death knell in in, uh, in theory. Yeah, no, absolutely. So both of these things can be tied back to money, right? Uh, at the end of the day, and this ties in what you said at the beginning, right? Is it's just uh, <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, if it if users are are leaving the site more often than they're leaving competitive sites, uh, and they're not coming back, that's going to hit your revenue line. So turns it into dollars and cents. Another way that we think of UX influencing the top line and the bottom line, especially in in digital and in web, is the role that UX plays in search engine optimization and placement of various sites in in search. Would would you argue that the Carfax example that we looked at a moment ago, that because their bounce rate is higher, that you would conclude that they would have less optimal search rankings as well? Up. Uh you know, it could be that that happens. I mean, as we know, Google has stated many times that they have over 200 ranking factors. Um, and we do need to remember that relevance is by far the most important always. But, um, but having said that, um, uh, there's a ton of discussion that happens in the SEO community about the impact of user engagement uh, on uh, SEO, whether it's direct or indirect. Um, and and there, you know, I don't know how many patents published on this topic. Uh, large uh, quantities of them are out there. Um, and, but unfortunately, patents, you know, it's a patent. It doesn't mean they actually use it in any commercial <laughs> right, way. Right. So yeah. that's the, the challenge with that. Um, but we have to remember uh, that the web is an ecosystem. Uh, and if you're creating bad experiences for people, um, uh, that, that's going to hit you in other ways. You're going to get yeah. fewer links from websites. Nobody argues whether links are, uh, are a ranking factor. Um, uh, you are definitely going to take a hit on the conversion rate side of things. So the revenue you get from SEO is down. Um, there may well be other direct factors that Google might use to impact your SEO, but whether it's direct or indirect, I don't care. Because if at the end of the day, it's creating negative pressure on your organic search rankings, um, the, the directness of the signal is actually irrelevant. Um, so, uh, I, I will say, therefore, to finally get around to answering your question directly, yes, I do believe it uh, <laughs> could have an impact on the organic search rankings for uh, for Carfax, which, by the way, actually happens to be doing quite well for other reasons. But that doesn't mean that they couldn't be doing better and, sure. um, and that there isn't something there. So that's sort of my long-winded take uh, on, on that one. Um, so another I was thing to ask you about this, I was going to ask you this concept of pogo sticking that, that you've mentioned oh, uh, right. to, me in the, to me in the past. I'm not, I'm, I'm not, I, I remember you saying that before, but I'm not totally clear what that, what that user condition is. And I think we've got a slide for pogo. Sticking yeah, as well. exactly. You're right. We do. And I should talk to that. So here's an example of a thing that Google could look at. Uh, I'm not saying they do, but it, just to give some people some intuition are the kinds of things that, <coughs> excuse me, that Google has as signals. So imagine someone enters a, a query and um, they arrive at the, the search results and they click on the first result um, and they don't get what they want. And let's imagine that they bounce back very quickly, <coughs> excuse me, to the organic search results. And then they click on the next one and then they don't come back. Their session appears to be complete. Um, so this is what we call pogo sticking, and it is something that uh, could be uh, uh, something they use as a direct measurement. Um, uh, there are many other things that Google could be looking at related to this. 
people sometimes say, well, is a high bounce rate a, um, a negative ranking factor? That's even simpler than, than pogo sticking. They just go to the search, your page out of the search results and they come back, you know, short time later. Um, and maybe, but that signal is probably a little too simple. It would be fairly easily gamed. But the idea is right, is that Google would try to measure these kinds of things. Yeah. I, I do want to say one other thing briefly on, on just simple bounce rate, which is the reason why I don't think they use that as a direct signal is I can name queries for you where a fast back, a bounce back out of the search results would actually be a good thing. Absolutely. Yeah, I was going to mention that, that some, sometimes sometimes being able to conclude your information retrieval rapidly is a sign of success, not a sign of failure. Correct. And so, you know, somebody types in uh, uh, convince and convert phone number. Right. right. I just did it right, right, right before we got on air. Uh, I, I went uh, and I did uh, peso to dollar conversion. I'm going to Mexico next week on vacation. Peso to dollar conversion. Click, got it back. Right. I, it was a seven second session. Right. Um, right. And, and so a very, very quick bounce. But I got what I needed and I was out. Yeah. So you got to be careful about those signals. But the idea is right. That these are the kinds of things that Google can measure. Yeah. All right. So um, the other thing I was going to ask you about, I was going to ask you about mobile um, real quick. Oh, and, okay. and so many people are, are visiting sites on phones now, uh, increasingly so, and in some categories, uh, predominantly so. What, what's the impact of, of that on, on UX? Well, yeah, I mean, it's it's a funny thing because, you know, obviously when you have a screen like that one, right, uh, it's, uh, um, you know, quite a bit different experience than typical laptop experience that that we all grew up in this industry having or desktop experience as we still call it. Um, there's a lot less real estate uh, to work with. And there's very conventional things that most mobile UX designers know instinctively, you know, it's like, if I'm dealing with a smartphone screen, <coughs> excuse me, um, you know, I gotta make the links large enough so I can, my finger can touch them or yeah. the, the text large enough so that I can read it uh, on a mobile device. Uh, by the way, remembering that while your designer might be 25, the person using the screen might be 55. Uh, maybe their eyesight isn't quite as good. Um, and, and just, you know, uh, a more, uh, well, another design element for mobile is, uh, am I gonna put a thousand word article on my smartphone? Um, and well, the answer is maybe, but maybe I ought to fill it with accordions and different ways of breaking up the content so I can find what I want quickly on those pages. Um, I think that's really important to, uh, uh, to remember when you think about, uh, uh, you know, mobile design and, and one thing I like to, to advise people about this, which almost nobody does, um, is shouldn't we be at the stage today where we design our mobile site first and figure out how to extract our desktop site from that rather than designing our desktop site and then squishing it down into a little tiny screen? I mean, so true. And, and so, so few people do it that way. We are, uh, I've seen a shift in that regard in many cases in email design. We do a fair amount of uh, work with people in the email uh, space and, and you're starting to see more and more enterprise level email marketers, email design specialists literally build mobile first and, and desktop second. Uh, hopefully once that takes root, you'll start to see it more and more on the website side as well. Yeah, absolutely. Although I do want to remind people to not forget about desktop. Uh, uh, there's data that I saw from Google that's uh, about three years old, but still, I don't think it's changed dramatically, is that 75% of conversions still happen on desktop. Yeah. So you got to do both to be truly successful, I think. No doubt. So what about the impact of uh, audio and video? I mean... This has uh, interesting UX implications too, doesn't it? Oh, I'm, no question. And and I've certainly lived that transformation myself. I, I used to personally write four blog posts a week. And I did that every week for almost 10 years. And, and now I write a new blog post every six or eight weeks. But yet I have 
uh, three podcasts that I record per week. I have multiple videos that I record per week. So my own content creation and frankly, my own content consumption at some level has, has absolutely shifted, at least in part, from the written word to multimedia. And I'm certainly not alone. Every time I see more data published on the consumption of a video, I think, well, surely surely that's the end surely surely we've reached peak video and then and then all of a sudden i get another report which is it's up another 22 percent. i'm like holy cow uh and and look i i i I see this myself sometimes when my when my son's home he's a big sports fan as am i and a lot of times eric will be having breakfast at kind of the counter there in the kitchen uh and we'll both be on espn as we often do in the morning and i'll be reading uh sort of the story and i'll look over and he's watching the video of the exact same story because on espn almost every story has has the 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 written uh, story and then a video which is the exact same content and it some of it's just consumer preferences younger uh, consumers uh, prefer uh, multimedia even more so than uh, middle-aged and older consumers and so we're seeing lots and lots of people uh, putting lots and lots of time and energy into creating uh, audio and video content and that's great right it makes sense consumption patterns change however especially when you combine that with mobile etc it's not always as easy to to navigate those things sometimes it's harder for search as well so my advice and i think you'll agree eric is that you should do both because here's the thing if you got video you have audio you just strip out the audio file and if you have audio you have text you just transcribe it and clean it up so my advice is you want to do more video you might want to do more more audio spectacular but don't force a site visitor into using that modality. Let them pick the format that they prefer. And in fact, on our website, Convince to Convert, which we'll talk about in a second, on most of our uh, uh, articles, most of our blog posts, we actually allow people to click to listen to them. We, we audio transcribe every article. Fun fact, average time on site for written posts, two and a half minutes. Average time on site when people listen, nine minutes. That's interesting. And I really like the idea that you put out there because I was going to say it if you didn't, uh, give people the choice, right? And make it really easy for them to configure. Yeah, let them pick. Right. You go to you go to sites like uh, CNN, for example, and the video uh, automatically starts playing whether I want it to God, or not. God, it's so annoying. So yeah. autoplay video is the worst. Yeah. So, but speaking of that as a common UX mistake, uh, Maybe we can talk about some others. Uh, you're going to show an example. Uh, you're going to reference your own site here. You're going to throw yourself under the bus, it seems. Oh, well, I just, you know, we, we always want to try and and, and do better work uh, and uh, yeah. and sort of, uh, you know, eat our own dog food, I think, as the metaphor goes. This is our current website, Convince Convert, our home page. And and I don't it's kind of like our Tokyo Marine example. I don't think it's abysmal. I don't think it's a disaster, uh, but there's a lot of words there and you got to go through a lot of stuff to, to get to any actual options. Like what what do we actually want to want to do? And as you as you scroll down, um, when we start to look at our blog posts and our podcast episodes, et cetera, uh, there's a lot of thumbnails and, and a lot of kind of um, there's just a lot of visual noise there. So we are literally days away um, uh, uh, from launching a new homepage, which is much more simplified, uh, much easier for users to make choices and understand the services that we provide. And also, uh, and I know you'll appreciate this, Eric, loads a lot faster because we're not loading thumbnails for, for every blog post, every podcast episode. It's much more text um driven as opposed to uh photo driven uh and i think that's going to help a lot it also just because of the way it lays out uh works a lot better on mobile to your earlier point yeah and in fa fact i'm gonna uh, since you mentioned speed i'm gonna show a quick chart here um uh, which is a, a lighthouse report uh for a major brand i'm not naming it in this case uh but it's a, a globally recognized brand um, scoring 14 out of 100 for performance, um, when especially on your mobile devices, when the, when, when the performance of a site is so dismally slow. I mean, talk about low-lying fruit in the, uh, the UX arena. When you have the really poor performing sites, that's a really poor user experience. And it's just, just something that people have to, to, to do better at. 
and it's typically a, a, a byproduct of having too many graphics loading and, and too many scripts loading, yes? Yeah, absolutely. And, and usually there's some simple things to do. Unfortunately, sometimes it's a little bit complicated too because these tools kind of give you all these metrics for things that are taking too long. But because the discussions are sort of the loading process of the page has many threads running, it's trying to figure out the right combination of optimizations is sometimes a little hard, but it's really important to do this work. Yeah, no question. Uh, would you say, from a from a low hanging fruit perspective, do you think that's the do you think that's the 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 first one is to make it faster, or is it to 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 simplify or sort of take things off of a particular particular page? If you said, hey, what's the what's the first thing you probably work on? What would it be? Well, uh, I. I so many sites, the mobile experience is just messed up. So yes, site speed is definitely in the list. Uh, but you know, I kind of go first, maybe to look at the the mobile site, see how that looks. Uh, even though a large percentage of conversions do happen on desktop, as I said earlier, uh, the data we have says you know something on the order of sixty percent of all your visits start from a mobile device. You just got to make that experience look good because if that's the first interface somebody has with your brand don't don't lose the opportunity you know put something good in front of them and make them feel good about it um and the other thing that i find that happens a lot um is uh just the way you manage linking on your site mm. is kind of a big yeah. deal i mean I've, I've arrived at sites and flipped through the main navigation <clears throat> excuse me and there's like a thousand links it's like <laughs> oh my god what do you do with all this stuff you know, people have to realize not every product or every category in your site necessarily has the same priority. Help, yeah. you know, organize this thing and make it a little easier for people to find their way around. Uh, another popular one is sites without breadcrumbs. Um, breadcrumbs are really good for search. They're also good for users. It helps them just quickly reconnect and understand where yeah. they are in the site hierarchy. Uh, and then site speed is definitely in the list as well. So those are four things that I think are in the the low yeah, line. I, I love the I love the millions of links example. What I always tell people is if everything is important, by definition, nothing is important, right? There there's right. there is no circumstance by which this is all of equal importance that does, that can't exist. Uh, I think we have a before and a, after example to to look at, don't we? Uh, yes, we do. So we can take a look here. Uh, this is. Uh, a site called Ameren, um, and uh, it's not so much a before and after example, but it's uh, um, you're seeing both the desktop and the mobile design. Um, here's a case of trying to have a site that's uh, um, meant to be very approachable in both environments, and you see yeah. yet how different they are, even though they're drawn out of the same uh, user need set. Um, so you get just a really good adaptation to the mobile environment here, I think is a big thing that we're- Well, seeing. I love that mobile homepage. Like, okay, here's five things, click one. Yes. Or leave, right? Those are your choices. Click one of these five things or leave. Yeah, well, and if they, if you get the large percentage of the users that way, that could be exactly what- It almost, reminds me of, it almost reminds me of classic landing page design considerations, right? Like, like reduce the number of options. You wanna increase conversion, you reduce options, and you reduce sort of leaking that traffic. And we think about sort of what you want a landing page to do, a mobile homepage or any really mobile interface uh, can probably adhere to some of the same principles. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, and, you know, I, I'm a fan and I actually speak uh, when I'm out, out speaking about things uh, about how important it is to offer comprehensiveness in your con content. Uh, and I do believe that's important, but that doesn't mean you put it all on. <laughs> not all page. at once. Yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> not on the same page. That's right. You got to let people layer into it. And you got to, you know, yeah. make it easy to do for them to do that. So that is a UX challenge. But uh, yes, not all at once. Exactly. As you said. Exactly. So. Um, I guess the, the, the next question really though is, if I'm trying to measure this stuff, what kind of metrics should I be using and how do I go about doing that? It, it depends a little bit on what kind of company you are and what kind of site you're running. Uh, but I will say one thing categorically, you shouldn't measure everything, right? There's a lot of things you could measure, but that doesn't mean you should measure them. And, and I think oftentimes uh, in, in UX and in digital in general, 
we 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 measure we're guilty of over measuring right too many success metrics and then we get conflicting stories uh and and we don't really see a clear narrative so we're like well i don't really know what any of this means so i would advise you to pick a handful of metrics that really matter to your organization that everybody buys into as important and and then really focus on those i think we have an example of a few that 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 might uh, be relevant for a lot of different organizations page speed as we talked about uh, earlier bounce rate as we also uh, talked about a little bit earlier time spent on page so when people show up on the site uh, how long do do they do they stay uh, as we mentioned in some cases it's you want them to stay longer and in some cases you don't want them to stay longer you right. want them to get what they want and leave so you got to understand what you're trying to accomplish on a related front pages per session. So how many pages does a, does a visitor consume on your site? Uh, in some cases, uh, you want that number to be up. In other cases, you want that number to be lower. And today with more and more sites um, adhering to a long scrolling page format, pages per session is sometimes less important than others. Uh, it just depends on kind of how your site is built. Certainly conversion rate and average order size, if you're in the e-commerce business is, is, is pretty critical. And I'm a big fan of repeat visits from a content um, a quality standpoint. If somebody comes once, unless they have a very transactional query, uh, I would love for them to come back again and be able to, to measure that. Uh, as we took, looked at in that e-marketer chart, Eric, if if people say, hey, I'm through with this organization after one, two, or three bad experiences, if we see people coming back to the site over and over, I think we can uh, stipulate to the fact that they haven't had enough bad experiences to, to turn them off. Yeah, and I think an interesting example of this, uh, uh, you know, blogs or, or videos or podcasts, um, those very often might be single page per session visits because the person got what they wanted, uh, so that's a good thing. But if you did a good job with the content, they're a repeat visitor. So that's right. Have, yeah, they'll come back for the next the next edition. Yeah, so you have to you have to think through the interaction of these things. It's not reasonable to expect something which is um, effectively blog level content, even though it may be a video. I'm just looping it in the same bucket here. Um, you know, you should expect that that bounce rate might be high because the person came for a piece of content, they got it, they were done. Yeah. But do they come back? So so that's a that's a good one. Um, so how do you go about testing these things, you know, with real users? Uh, or do you have other techniques that you recommend? Well, I, I mean, look, ideally, you would test all UX enhancements with, with real people. Uh, ideally, you would test every UX enhancement with an A-B test or uh, a challenger and a control. Uh, I think we all understand why that is important and, and how that can yield superior outcomes. As a practical matter, I think it would be uh, unfair of myself and Eric to suggest that you're going to do that every single time out. But I'll tell you this, when you are figuring out what your overall budget and investment is for UX, don't forget to add some budget for testing and optimization, whether that's software driven or personnel to help you run those kind of tests. Like don't think here's the, here's the optimization budget. And then we add a second budget for testing. A lot of times that budget gets killed. So make sure you roll it all together. It's just an easier way to go about it. But, but I will tell you one thing after having been in this business now for almost 30 years, even when you've been doing this for almost your whole career, a lot of times you believe that you are right and you know what will work because you've done it for so long. And I cannot tell you how often that is mistaken. Uh, there is something called the curse of knowledge and the curse of knowledge very much applies to user experience. In my estimation, I have been down this road so many times when you think, you know, what's going to be a superior layout, a superior submit button, a superior, uh, form design. And when you actually test it, your assumptions were manifestly incorrect. So this is one part of your business where trusting your gut is bad advice. No, absolutely. I'm fond of telling people that the chances that you take a bunch of smart people, put them in a room, come up with the best UX they can. The chances you get it perfect are exactly zero percent. So, yeah. <laughs> no, you might get you might get it okay, 
but there's always a way to do yeah. it better. And, and also, uh, I've discovered, I'm sure you have too, Eric, from a testing perspective, sometimes the littlest darn things can have such a big impact on, on performance and conversion and customer satisfaction, things that you'd almost overlook. I remember one time we did a test on what are the labels for a form should be to the left of the box or on top of the box. And it was like a 13% difference in conversion, just making that little change, which I mean, is little tiny things that, that are, that are almost feel like unimportant can have huge, uh, huge impact. So don't overlook it. Well, now the audience wants to know the answer. Was it on top or was it to the left? On top in that case, on top <laughs> was the superior one. Cool. All right, so um, let me ask you this: um, If if you there's a lot of things we could do, right? From from a uh, uh, from a UX perspective, we've mentioned a lot of them here today. Uh, how would you how would you prioritize? Well, you know, you want to try to start with the things that are big, and uh, that are that are always big. Um, you know, whether the labels to the left or the top of a, a box. That's a subtlety you you do to that level. You may find those things. Uh, you know, for years people talked about orange being the color of converting buttons, and so the new black buttons orange, and, and and sometimes that still works. But uh, but there's there's really simpler things, and I already mentioned a little bit about this earlier. Just you know, what does your mobile site look like? Make sure it looks clean, tappable, uh, readable, uh, that sort of stuff. Uh, you could talk about accessibility uh, here. Uh, and making sure those uh, that have some sort of impairment can have a good site experience. The navigation, making sense, making sensible decisions of just prioritizing people's ability to find the content they're looking for. Yeah. And, and a really thoughtful approach to that prioritization, which impacts your linking, your navigation, your layout. Um, if you can, those are things that you should be able to get somewhat close with the smart people in a room that I alluded to before. So we have an example here from Cedar Sinai. Um, uh, this is a, a before picture with kind of a messy navigation for uh, this particular site. Uh, and if we take a look at the uh, and weak performance, as it says, uh, but if we look at the after chart, uh, you're going to see a much more clean uh, look. Uh, it just feels more approachable. Uh, it also feels more mobile ready. It's more uh, uh, you, just from the design, you can see it's going to be much more compatible with a mobile layout with minimal change in the, the way the site is laid out. Uh, so the, the cleaner feel actually matters to people. And the ability to find what you're, you're looking for, I think, are, are really big deals. Yeah, definitely more welcoming as well. It just it just feels, as you said, more friendly and uh, inviting. Yeah, absolutely. So we we have a little bit of time left. Uh, why don't we see if we could take some questions from Let's do it uh, from the audience. Oh, wait. We'll take I, questions about about sure. casket manufacturing, whatever you whatever you like. Yeah. Uh, I actually meant to uh, share one metric on the Cedar Sinai. Oh yeah. Uh, so just to give you an idea, overall engagement. Uh, a uh, 33% increase on desktop and a crazy 968% increase on mobile. Just that. Yeah, that is remarkable. Yeah, it is remarkable. But anyway, let's go ahead and take on the questions. So I, I'm going to fire this one at you. Uh, uh, so, uh, but uh, you and I can collaborate on it. So, what do we okay. think the most important design elements for SEOs and UX designers to collaborate on are? Well, the first thing I would say is information architecture at the H1, H2, H3 level, because how you treat your headlines and your subheads, et cetera, um, has a pretty big impact on the visual design, which which your designers are going to care about, but also has a pretty big impact on, on SEO because it gives a lot of strong cues to the search engine. So uh, off the top of my head, that'd be the first thing I'd make sure that everybody's kind of on the same page. Yeah, and then I have already been talking about navigation and interlinking, and I think that has a really big impact on SEO. Um, but I will get back to, um, we, we can't forget that this is all an ecosystem that we're living in across the board here. So bad user experiences rebound on you in many, many different ways. 
uh, including how linkable your site are and any, anything you do to, to make the site more engaging and valuable to the users will ultimately have some level of impact on your SEO. All right. Let's see That's if we. Question. Uh, next question, please. Okay. That's, that's the the only question for now. I want to ask you um, one question that we didn't address here. So, so you looked at the um, uh, the Cedars example and and kind of the before after uh, at the end there. That kind of a project where they've got a site, uh, and again, it's not it's not like a disaster, but but it definitely needs some work. W how long does that take? I know that's an unfair question, but but if you're going to say, hey, we're going to redo your UX here to make this homepage and mobile site, all this stuff more inviting. And obviously we saw the eye popping results in, um, uh, in, in performance and success. Is that a 60 day project? Is that a 17 year project? Like what's the what's the window to think about for something like that? So I think it depends on the level of formality you put into the process. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is I mean, ideally, all of this should go all the way back to mapping out the personas and the customer journeys of the people who are your prospective buyers. Um, and that part by itself can provide so much insight into what you should be trying to do with your site. Um, and being very thoughtful and thorough about that by itself can take 60 days, say. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, and, and we just really can't overlook the importance of understanding your target audience and, and what it is that they're going to be looking for on a site. Um, and then once you, you get to that, you get through that, you know, what do you do in terms of creating uh, storyboards or markups for what the sites look like? Mm -hmm. uh, it's going to look like? Do you create multiple scenarios and then do... Uh, user testing even before you build the site with uh, with those and so you can take six months on a process like this and for the right brand and the right business uh, uh, and the right amount of audience at stake that's probably what you should do yeah probably worth it as well if you're gonna get those kind of results yeah no exactly um, but uh, on the other hand there's a lot of smaller businesses out there who can't afford all of that formality um, and they can approach things a lot more uh, tactically and um, and still get good results, right? Uh, so I, I talked down on the idea of the smart people in the room, uh, but <laughs> but by all means, put the smart people in the room and be thoughtful about it. Yeah, it's better than not putting any smart people in any rooms. That's right. And then you still use the... Uh, the idea of trying to understand what your personas are, even though you might re research might be less formal uh, and what the customer journeys are like. You can look at, you know, the data you have available and, and maybe, you know, complete that process in two, three months and make some really significant improvements. Yeah. So, um, so in, in terms of the navigation items, mm -hmm. um, what do you think those should focus on? One of the questions here from the audience is, um, uh, should they be used to promote benefits um, uh, as opposed to, I'm going to, you know, features or functionality, that, that kind of thing? I, I think, yes. And it's funny you, you asked that uh, because in the, in the, in our own example, convince convert, we looked at our future homepage, the, the project that we, completed uh, just before this homepage redesign was a fundamental overhaul of the navigation on the site. For the longest time, our navigation was sort of focused on what, what do we do? And now it's focused on what do you want? Right. So uh, as just a sort of a, an example, we would have a nav label, which would be um, consulting. Now we have a nav label, which is content marketing. And inside that we have content marketing, consulting, content marketing, articles, content marketing, podcasts, content marketing, research. So, so it's, it's topically aligned more so than services aligned, because when we looked at all of our uh, users and interviewed them and studied them and looked at our search volume, everybody was coming to the site for 
a specific type of flavor of digital marketing or customer experience advice and counsel. So we decided to just reorient all the navigation around that topic as opposed to here's what we do and why you should give us money to do it. Yeah. Yeah. I do think uh, the, that focus on the benefits, it, look, it's just good marketing in general, right? Uh, and it cuts across everything uh, uh, that you do with your website and even what you do with your, your SEO, uh, for that matter, just to tie back into that. Um, so I have a question here about um, coming up with a good balance and what would be a good balance between data-driven design versus result-driven design, mm -hmm. uh, i.e. testing and planning before the release or responding to change in metrics after release. So, uh, you know, the balance between uh, getting it out right as much as possible up front uh, versus after. Well, eventually you got to ship it, right? I mean, I, you know, the, the reality is if, if, if you're going to test UX enhancements until they're perfect before you launch them, you will never launch them because it will never be perfect. So I think the answer is is both, but you have to do it in a structured way, not an ad hoc way. Uh, you have to say, th these are the thresholds that we're going to meet for testing and optimization. Once we meet those thresholds, even though it's not perfect, we're going to launch and then we're going to use actual user data to make a second round of enhancements uh, and optimization recommendations based on an additional sort of threshold or, or set of objectives. But, but you can, you, you can a B test yourself um, into inertia real quick. And I've been down, I've been down that road. So uh, I would, I would suggest, Hey, get it 85% right launch it and then add the other 15% after it's launched. Right. I mean, perfect is the enemy of progress in business, right? Yeah, so well said. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. So uh, I think we're at time, uh, but thanks so much, Jay. This was awesome. Oh, it was a blast. Really enjoyed it. So much fun. Yeah. And uh, thanks uh, all for listening. Hope uh, you found it valuable and uh, uh, hope to see you in an upcoming webinar sometime.